to Theory Underground. I'm your host today and every day, David McCarricker. Theory Underground is a teaching platform first and foremost. And what we're doing today is going over one of the lectures that I gave last, well, I was going to say last year, not quite. It was still this year, summer of 2023. Let me pull it up here. So we go into the course. This is the, so right now it says being in time division two, but division one is also in there. It's included for people who sign up for division two. Uh, and we're going over division one as a way to prepare for division two. Actually, let me switch back here. I want to show you all something. And that is, let's see if I can pull it up. Well, let's, I'll use this screen for now. Um, so check this out. I know it's kind of confusing. You see a bunch of other stuff over there. But what I want to show you, that stuff doesn't matter. The, like, Just look at this. So on December 6th was the one-year anniversary of Theory Underground. And I announced a bunch of upcoming courses. Well, this... This is the one that we're doing today. Wait, where'd it go? Be in time, where'd it go? Oh my God. There we go. Feast your eyes. Um, it's going to be held on Saturdays, 9 a.m. L.A., 12 p.m. New York City, 6 p.m. Freiburg. So... coming up really quick here it begins on January 6th and uh, the reason I'm playing these division one lectures is to kind of force myself to go over the material again get excited about it uh, but I'm also hoping some other people get excited about it um, so far at least two people who were doing other stuff with theory underground recently dived into this course and so or like what I mean is like they're going through the backlog of lectures from Division One, getting prepared for Division Two, which is really exciting. So, um, yeah, check it out. Uh, the other ones are currently available on the channel. You can just go look at the backlog of things that have been live streamed on this channel. But with that, we're going to get it started here because if, uh, I don't know, like if things go well, maybe we'll play two two previous lectures? I don't know. I, I would be happy to stream all day long, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what the day brings. All right. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the channel. This is David McCarricker. That's who I am. And the channel is Theory Underground. So for those who've never been here before, we know, we know, we know, speed it up there. For the last four months of its development, welcome. For those who've been around for years, seeing its development before it had this new name and approach, welcome. Um, today is a very special day. I am a sort of nervous wreck because of what I have before us. Today, I'm talking about the announcement of this course. Let me make this thumbnail larger. Being and time. Oh, I see what was going on. That's the wrong lecture. The correct lecture is down here. It's uh. Ch uh, chapter three, part B and C. I was like, what the heck? Three. Why? Lecture, chapter what three, B and C, chapter four, submit reading. Shut up, thing. Here we go. There we go. Welcome, everybody, to week, technically week four. This is chapter three, parts B and C. I was just kind of checking everybody's pulse beforehand, and at least a couple of people, and again, found it to be slightly easier than normal, though no easier in general, because this is obviously still the same book. But it's section B where we get into Descartes, and the first two sections, 19 and 20, are, can be a real slog if you're just kind of really getting bogged down and, okay, I'm going to check his, 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 uh, is it Latin or French? It's Latin? It is Latin? 
because I thought that Descartes also wrote in French, but I think that that was the discourse on method that he wrote in French, uh, whereas other things that he wrote, he did publish in Latin. And, uh, you know, if you go to the back of the book and you're following it through, um, it seems like, okay, yeah, this, this, is, this is Descartes. If you've ever read Descartes, this is Descartes. This is what he believes. Um, and Heidegger tends to give his own sort of paraphrase of the Latin. So if you weren't going to the back of the book, you should have been fine. And maybe I should have given you all a heads up about that in advance so you didn't worry too much about it, right? But, um, yeah, so this week we're going to be talking about, uh, this is supposed to say summary here, not... Descartes, the man, myth and menace. Um, am I able to fix it right here? Yeah. We'll get to Descartes, the man, the myth and menace right here. And one of the fun themes throughout this lecture, you'll get to see a bunch of AI-generated art of Descartes looking kind of... I, I won't use any adjectives. I want you to fill in the blank. I don't know what he's looking like here, but I like it. <laughs> and using AI to generate stuff about Descartes is really, really cool because Descartes is the first philosopher that I'm aware of that thought about the problem of artificial intelligence. And he was thinking about this in like the 1640s or something like that. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty wild. Nance and I just did an exegetical reading of this that is like of the discourse on method. It's six hours long. I had to go to town yesterday. I tried to upload it. It took eight hours to get the 40% that, because the internet was bad here. So I went to a coffee shop. The internet was bad there. So I went to a McDonald's just to compare. It was just as bad at the McDonald's. So then I went to a friend's house and I had to upload it in an hour because he has super, super fast upload speeds. So yeah, just a funny little story about moving and how constantly moving from one context to another context uh, is, is, is throwing me for a loop. Um, and that makes sense because we are the kinds of beings for whom worldhood is an issue <laughs> and who are supposed to allow everything to fall into the background, right? So um, if I turn off this virtual camera for you all, then you'll see I'm in a new location. See? Look at that. New location. This is just some, this is the little, air, will become an Airbnb in a, in a shop at my parents right now where we're staying for a month. Um, and when I use this, this, this background, this uh, sort of vapor wavy background, um, it gives a sort of continuity to things to fill in for the fact that I'm constantly in new locations, but constantly having to tear down and rebuild my computer or my whole setup and, oh, now I've got a screens over here and over here and over here and I'm just like constantly trying to find a new way, but I can never really optimize because I'm constantly having to rebuild. This is, should be illustrative, I think, of what it is to be a Dasein, what it is to participate in this kind of life called Dasein. And that is that we, we want to figure out, okay, where do these things go? Where, where are they usefully ready to hand? So that I don't have to keep thinking about them. So that they can fade into the background of my circumspective dealings. So that I'm able to then focus on one thing at a time. But instead, if I'm constantly having to, oh, I have to uninstall and reinstall Zoom. Now I have to mess with the camera settings. And now I have to, oh my God, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nightmare. And so... On the one side, I'm like theorizing time energy while never having any, which is kind of why I theorize it. Um, and on the other side, we're I'm t teaching about Dasein and worldhood and circumspective dealings. And I'm like, yeah, I'm feeling that every moment of the day here. Um, but with that said, uh, today should be a pretty fun one. It's going to be uh, a lot more quote heavy, I think, than maybe we tend to get, and I think it's because reading a quote through, having someone else read it, and then me kind of parsing it out and doing an exegetical of that section, um, I, I've been thinking a lot about the function of that in terms of reading uh, this work. And I think it's just probably the, one of the most useful things. If the person who's exegetically unpacking it is focused on trying to make it uh, to, to, to make it more relatable, to make it more intuitive, to make it more, oh, okay, yeah, put it in different ways. And so that's what I'm challenging myself to do a little bit more here. But basically, we'll move through sections B and C today. We'll be talking about Descartes as the father of modernity, or, or also as the man, the myth, and the menace. Um, we'll be talking about presence ontology, that is to say, ontology that prioritizes not just what is immediately present, but that which is immediately present that can be repeated, right? 
So this is the, uh, the hard-on that modern science has for repeatability. Uh, math as a guarantor of knowledge. If you ever grew up with people saying, well, it's just true. It's just the way it is. Two plus two equals four. And then they go, God made, God wrote the Bible. That's our, you know, they, they always like make these sort of analogies to math. And it's just like, it just is what it is. Two plus two equals four. A equals A is what it is. And it's like this sort of, oh yeah, it's obvious. It's clear. It's distinct. Um, and therefore that should be like, the primary criterion for what truth is, right? Because we borrow this analogy for what truth is from the successes of math. Um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit and show that math is present at hand. Um, it's not the primary mode of existence that we take up with things. Um, we'll talk about how this idea that both Descartes through Nietzsche have of uh, we invest, as subjects, we invest objects with values or value, which could be called subjectivism, right? Or you could be like someone who likes to take the, the objective viewpoint on everything, but then whenever it comes to matters of value, you always go, oh yeah, well, but that's subjective, right? That is in part what's being combated here. That mindset, that belief system, those assumptions could be said to be nihilism. And for someone like Heidegger, it's nihilism in its purest. This idea that it's just us, our, we're the beings that make things meaningful, but that's just in our heads. That's just in our feelings. That's not reality in this bigger sense. We'll get into... Uh, after that, we'll get into section C, Dasein's world. We'll get into basically the difference between measurement and meaningful distance, right? I love that section because it's kind of priming us for what he's going to do with time, which is really important, I think. Um, deseverance and directionality, I hope to make that a little bit clearer if I understand them correctly. I, I think I do, and so I hope I'll be able to make it a little bit more relatable. Um, if you listen to the Hubert Dreyfus lecture on this one in particular, um, he spends the whole lecture kind of like the bumbling old man professor, you know, who's like really sweet, but also kind of confused and tripping up and problematizing and thinking out loud, which Carl Jaspers in The Idea of the University says explicitly, seeing a professor do that is itself, it helps us learn how to think. It helps us learn how to research. So when he's doing that, um, it's not just, oh, he's bumbling around. No, he's actually showing you his process of hystericizing himself. He's like, I think I understand this, but I don't because because I think Heidegger doesn't understand this because I think Heidegger's confused here because Heidegger says this, but then look what he also says. And so I, and so, but from my standpoint, I actually am not so sure it's as confusing as uh, Dreyfus makes it out to be. He's got this weird thing about changing words in the book. Like he wants to make every, every instance of dealing, say coping. And then in that same lecture from 2007, um, it, whatever lecture it is, it's like number seven, number eight, number nine, one of those ones is where he's dealing with disseverance and directionality. And he's like, yeah, somebody called me out on this coping thing and pointed out that that has like this connotation for people for like dealing with dealing with things that are like stressful or hard, maybe traumatic. Um, and that's not what I've meant at all. I just kind of meant like being immersed in what you're doing. I can't find a word for that. And that was 2007, but now we all know it's vibing. So you can go through and every time it says dealing, don't write coping, write vibing. <laughs> and like I said last time, grooving, which was the 1960s version of vibing, but it's the same thing. Um, and then last question, we'll kind of touch on, is this idealism or is this subjectivism? Why would it be versus why wouldn't it be uh, versus, uh, or, you know, then we have to basically think, does it matter? And the quick and dirty is, it doesn't have to be. It really could be, but it doesn't have to be. And from the Heideggerian standpoint, it's not. And Richard Capio Bianco is putting out 
scholarly articles every few months for the last several years that I've been following him on academia.com, arguing for Heidegger's realism, that he is a realist, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's a really interesting sort of debate, this realism versus non-realism or anti-realism, um, because it's supercharged politically by people who care about material things and have this material analysis. But a lot of the academics who sit there and, and create different categories um, and then d come up with different kinds of materialism or different kinds of anti-realism or different kinds of not, it, they, they come up with all these different ways of conceptualizing it so that they can or can't be um, a realist or an idealist or whatever. Um, and those people are not in dialogue usually with the Marxist types of people who care so much about their specific way of conceptualizing materiality. So that's basically what I consider to be a really big problem uh, with a lot of miscommunication because all these academics either are ignorant of why people care about these terms as in they're supercharged politically and religiously, um, or or maybe they get their jouissance from pissing off Marxists. It's possible. And that's fine, too. That's a, a valid way to go about it. But um, I'm going to basically show you all a table. I know I haven't been showing a lot of tables. Some people probably love tables. And so check it out. Section B versus Section C. We've got actually in the very top of uh, one of the pages here, I think it's like one... Uh, 135. Yeah, basically in 135, um, at the very top, he sets out this first table. I, I set out the second table. The first table is on, so section B, um, which, or which includes these other, I guess we could call it part C, which includes sections um, 19 through, what, 20? Is that right? Or is it 21? I don't care. We'll just say it. You got world is spatiality, and then he's going to go into the foundations of this definition, and then there's going to be a hermeneutical di discussion of the foundations of this definition of spatiality. So that's really what he's got to do in, in uh, part B. And then part C, let's go ahead and say part instead of section here. Go back to presentation mode. Part C, it's going to be spatiality of the readiness, of the ready to hand, spatiality of being in the world, and space and Dasein's spatiality. Those are all interrelated because they're obviously all of these are just aspects of being in the world. Readiness to hand is an aspect of being in the world or it's a mode of being in the world. Um, space and Dasein spatiality are in the world, in being in the world. This compound concept that he is unpacking from chapters two through five or I don't know. The, the main sections that he's working through being in the world. Right now we are in... Really, the first one, right? The next section, we're going to be talking about the who that is in the world. It feels like we already moved through being in because he gave us a little taste of it previously. But that's actually being saved for after the who is in the world. So right now, we're just talking about the spatiality of the world. The spatiality of the world, the who in the world, which is going to be not Dasein, but Dasman. Dasein finds itself in the world as part of a who, which is Dasman, the, the social order, the big other, the law, the norms, all of those things. So that's going to be the next chapter. That's really exciting because it's honestly the part that people read the most. In the same way that if you're reading Das Kapital, there's either the section on the working day, the section on primitive uh, accumulation, or the section on like the vampire analogy. And those are the three most cited parts of that book, usually read in excerpt form in college classrooms or whatever. Well, a lot of the juiciest, most uh, relatable excerpts are going to be in the, in the next chapter. 
So I would, uh, I would go somewhere, set yourself up with like a nice big six hour window so you can take your time reading a couple pages, go do some stretches, come back, take a couple notes, stare off into space, not stressing because you found some leisure time that you've secured for yourself away from devices, go back to reading, you know, you might want to do one or two of those. And if you can't do it, I understand that is the problem, but this will be the chapter where you probably find the most pleasure in doing that out of the whole book, maybe, besides the one on death in Division 2. So basically, though, I set it up this way because it's nice to see these as juxtaposed. On the one side, you got world as spatiality. On the other side, spatiality of the ready to hand. On the one side, you got foundations of this definition versus spatiality of being in the world. The foundations of the definition of world as spatiality, as res corporea, as extensio, is the Cartesian uh, assumption, way of seeing things, and problem for Heidegger. That is, is fundamentally just opposed to spatiality of being in the world, which we've kind of already gotten a taste of, haven't we? Because we've gotten into circumspective dealings and readiness to hand and how it takes breakdowns in the ready to hand for something to become uh, unready to hand. And only at the point that it is unready to hand might we then analyze it in a present at hand mode, right? So what is the spatiality of that which comes prior to that present at hand form of analysis? And what are the problems that come from taking the criteria of knowledge or the model of truth from the present at hand and applying it to our circumspective dealings in the world, which are value-laden, value-infused, inherently we are the kinds of beings for whom everything is meaningful, infused with meaning. And of course, that can be a bunch of bullshit, but it wouldn't be able to be bullshit if it wasn't for the fact that we were, in the first case, those kinds of beings for whom a meaningful understanding is key, right? The ontological condition of possibility for ontical bullshit beliefs is the fact that we are those kinds of beings who first are meaningfully immersed in our world in a way that is always kind of always kinds of ha kind of has to have a grasp of what's going on. And it does seem to me like a lot of people who have a really good grasp on a lot of the things going on locally they might say they might ha they might buy into a lot of these Cartesian principles and apply that to their religion or their atheism, and their religion or their atheism might be super naive or backwards. Uh, same with their politics; it might be very simplistic. But that's because that shit's present at hand. It's a, it's something they read in a book somewhere. It's something they were probably taught to memorize and repeat. But their circumspective dealings in the world, uh, if they're actually out there involved and immersed in the world probably have something to them that the person who spends her whole life kind of removed from that world is out of touch with, right? I think we all kind of get that. Um, but then the table that I added here, nature as res corporea, as extensio versus spatiality as Dasein relative, right? So it's not to say that everything's relative in the sense that says that everything's meaningless or, oh, Dasein, it's all rel relative to Dasein, so it's just subjective. Because the point is, is that it is Dasein that is the precondition for the subject-object division to even be meaningful. That division cannot be meaningful without being interpreted. And it's something that we discover we discover it and we interpret it and we're motivated and we are meaningful creatures. So we have to be careful with how we interpret that because the standard way to interpret that is just to say, ah, it's all meaningless. It doesn't matter. Uh, you know, eat a cheeseburger, kill somebody. It doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things, we'll lock you up, we'll call you bad, we won't like you, but it's really just our opinion. And you thinking that it was okay to do that, that was just your opinion. It's wholly arbitrary. 
And the point is, is it's not wholly arbitrary. The meaning for Dasein is never something that you can just make be what you want it to be. Okay. That's not to say that there is a fundamental reality that has natural law written into it and we can objectively discern what it is and therefore act accordingly. That's not what he's saying at all. And I think that that is a little bit more in line with something that um, kind of post-Cartesian uh, religious people will tend to say. Um, or that you might even find some versions of scientism that do their own version of it. Um, but all of that's downstream from what we're dealing with. We're talking about the precondition for all of that. Next is knowledge, meaning, and truth are mathish. I wrote mathish because we're, we're taking analogies from math and putting them over into broader regions of, of human being and meaning. Um, Nance, what do you remember about, um, from, our, from our readings that we did, what do you remember from uh, Descartes about math um, and, and how much he liked it? Yeah, he, he, he liked it so much that he thought it could be applied to everything in life, to the non-mathematical, um, and that things, everything could be broken down into, into formulas so that every problem has one and only one correct solution. Exactly. Only one correct solution is a really good way of saying that. Right here, let's jump to it. Non-contradiction applied outside of math and science. He says, I did not have enough presumption to hope to succeed better than the others, and when I noticed how many different opinions learned men may hold on the same subject, despite the fact that no one that no more than one of them can ever be right, I resolved to consider almost all as false any opinion which was merely plausible. So basically, unless, unless it was indisputable and it was just merely plausible, his, his radical doubt approach was to just assume if it just seems plausible, it must be false because in any situation where there's a lot of different opinions, only one opinion can be true. And of course, now we all have this very uh, useful metaphor of the elephant, and you got all the blind people holding onto different parts of the elephant and trying to communicate about it. Well, are any of them wrong? Is the person holding onto the elephant's tail wrong as as a uh, he describes that tail, or as you got someone like on the foot? Oh, I'm describing the foot. Is that person wrong? It's all part of this bigger thing. Um, and so, I don't know. Descartes didn't have to deal with that being a sort of common sense thing that we have recourse to now. Um, and really, I don't know if we would have recourse to that idea the same way that we do now, if not for Heidegger's influence on the, uh, the new left, really. The, those sort of post-left, post new left, Nietzschean, Heideggerian influenced, postmodern, post-structuralist, existentialist types of thinkers. So this idea that there's only one solution, though, is very important to him. Another quote, he says, In this I trust that I shall not appear too vain, considering that there is only one true solution to a given problem, and whoever finds it knows all that anyone can know about it. This is like, when we talk about reductionism, I mean, that's the essence of it, really. You get down to the fundamental thing, and now you know everything, right? So, really quick, I just want to see this. Does, do I have anything here? No, nothing about geometry. But basically what he wanted to do was to take the best of geometry, the best of algebra, and the best of logic, and then cor correct them all against one another to come to some general principles that he could apply to everything else in life. And he thought that by doing so, he would be able to... Uh, Save the world. I mean, really, I'm going to actually just read that quote first. Maybe I'll have Nance read it. Uh, devices. Let's just do a word search for devices. Right here. Um, can I zoom in? All right. Is this the one? Yeah. 
Okay. Could you read that, Nance? For they have satisfied me that it is possible to reach knowledge that will be of much utility in this life, and that instead of the speculative philosophy now taught in the schools, we can find a practical one, by which, knowing the nature and behavior of fire, water, air, stars, the heavens, and all other bodies which surround us, as well as we now understand the different skills of our workers, we can employ these entities for all the purposes for which they are suited, and so make ourselves masters and possessors of nature." This would not only be desirable in bringing about the invention of an infinity of devices to enable us to enjoy the fruits of agriculture and all the wealth of the earth without labor, but even more so in conserving health, the principle of good, and the basis of all other goods in this life. Wonderful. And I, I mean, part of our conversation we were having through the exegetical reading of the Discourse on Method was obviously um, we are all living Descartes' dream right now. We have an infinity of devices and labor-saving devices. Um, sadly, those labor-saving de devices haven't actually saved most people from that much labor. But yeah, it's wonderful. Did Christopher just get here? Oh, Anne, were you able to admit him? Oh, thank you so much. But there is a way of teaching this where you kind of make him out to be a menace in this sort of cosmic sense, like uh, like Descartes responsible for everything bad. Descartes the villain of the story. Descartes is the his thinking is like sort of the essence of empire, colonialism, dominion, um, expropriation, exploitation, oppression. Uh, you could even go so far as saying slavery. You could say that he his ideas are the real sort of uh, father, the real father of capitalism is not Adam Smith or Ricardo or anything like that. You could say it's Descartes, right? Now, I think that that's not exactly fair, and we'll get into why. Because <clears throat> I'm going to try to do a little bit of a defense of him and his world, because I don't think we should get too carried away. But just to kind of give people a sense here of the ecological and feminist critiques of this modern science movement that wanted to create an infinity of devices and labor-saving things and free us up from dominion of, the dominion of nature over us to turn the tables back onto nature. Because we were afraid of nature. We, were, we, were, uh, we didn't quite have it figured out yet, right? Like right now, you go camping, if a grizzly bear is coming around, they'll come and they'll move that grizzly bear somewhere else. They pretty much stay on top of it. Um, like, I guess, North Idaho, where I'm currently at, grizzly bears have been sighted a couple of times. and But they move. They, they're on top of it. They, 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 they take them to some other place that's very far away. Um, they don't kill them, obviously. But this... Uh, this just kind of speaks to the fact that we really are the Lord, the masters and possessors of nature now. We're not even as, we, we go camping, we're not even afraid of grizzly bears because they're so rare, right? Um, is any, have any of you ever like really been afraid of a drought or of a famine? Nance lives in Phoenix, so of course... <laughs> But as to the ecological feminist critique, obviously there's this, oh, masters, possessors of nature thing. Yeah, but where do people really come from? It's his homie, Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon supposedly said, my only earthly wish is to stretch the deplorably narrow limits of man's dominion. So he's saying man's dominion over the earth is not big enough, right? To stretch the deplorably narrow limits of man's dominion over the universe to their promised bounds. Nature will be bound into service, hounded in her wanderings, and put on the rack and tortured for her secrets. We got Ramsey Bolton over here, anybody? Right, like, that's what Francis Bacon sounds like when he says that. He's, it, this is a character from Game of Thrones for anyone who doesn't know. Ramsey Really, really uh, sadistic dude. Not a great guy. Um, like maybe arguably the most evil character in television that I'm aware of. 
Yeah, I see. That's why to me, like people are like, "Oh, Salo, it's like the worst movie ever," and I'm like, "Ramsey Bolton it, it is actually worse than those fascists who are torturing people." Like in Salo, like there's something worse about Ramsey. Of course, it's not as explicit, but anyway, here's another one of the quotes from 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 Bacon. I am come in very. I am, I am come in very truth, leading you to nature with all her children to bind her to your service and make her your slave. The mechanical inventions of recent years do not merely exert a gentle guidance over nature's courses. They have the power to conquer and subdue her, to shake her to her foundations. She's been shook to her foundations. If, if, stri if strip mining... If you've ever watched videos of strip mining and that doesn't make you think that she's being shaken to her foundations, we just have to think about the fact that a, a hot third world war really could wipe out most life on earth. And that's not just human life, right? And then we can always talk about climate change, et cetera, et cetera. I don't raise all of that to be like, oh, I, I want to let my my feminist or my ecological activist flag fly. I, I kind of am keeping that stuff largely bracketed here. I mainly just wanted to point out that this is the way that they're made villains today. Descartes is obviously not just going to be like, oh, they're so patriarchal. Instead, or so Heidegger's uh, critique of modern science, of, of Galileo, of Descartes, and of Bacon is not just this, but it is also this. In part, it is this. He does have this kind of a critique in mind. Probably less so on the feminist side, but in part on the ecological side. But he would probably have a problem with us even talking about ecology. He would probably have a problem with us talking about nature, right? Because he would probably have a problem with the framing of it, right? This, this oh, we are over here and it is over there and we have been dominating it. But we should instead be nicer to it or living in symbiotic relation to it. He would probably say... We're already reifying the frame that is itself the problem that has produced the mode of world disclosure, that has reduced all entities to objects that are either to satisfy our desires or to be turned into something or get, gotten out of the way of the pursuit and acquisition of those desires. But... You also have to think, well, doesn't his world as equipment kind of just sound still kind of like a whole mechanized system of, of, of extraction and, of, and that making the world ready to hand by freeing entities into involvement with Dasein? Doesn't that sound kind of like a slightly more poetic way and more relational way of talking about this same Cartesian um, idea of just really reducing it all to our use, right? And there's two interpretations I want you to keep in mind going forward. One is that either he himself hasn't realized how far his own critique of Descartes actually poses a problem on his own philosophy, and then he obviously is aware of it by the time he writes The Question Concerning Technology, which is a critique of this way of seeing things, or because he's planning on doing an imminent critique of all of this stuff, this is just his point of departure. What's closest to Dasein is its big other, its social laws, its norms, that's the next chapter, is its relationality, equipmentality, signification, all of these things about words and tools that we talked about last week. Those things are closest to us too, right? But just because it's closest to us doesn't mean that's where he stops. And so part of what we should be thinking is, how is he building up to a critique of what he's laying out as the fundamental things that are closest to us? And does he succeed? Obviously, the third division of being in time never got written. You could say that he realized he couldn't pull off the imminent critique uh, as well as he wanted to, and then he spent the rest of his uh 
Well, then he has two other periods of philosophizing. One which is saying, you know what, I've been a sort of agnostic, critical thinker for a long time, but now I'm going to go into the Nazi party very gung-ho and try to convince everybody they just need to free themselves into this involvement, which he actually uses that language. Um, yeah, he says that bourgeois freedom wants freedom from oppression, but real freedom is freedom to enlist in the Third Reich. Like he actually says that in one of his lectures in 1933. We've got the receipts. Nance and I have gone over it. If anybody wants a video where we go over that stuff, I can share it with you. It is also on the forum. Um, but that's kind of, I, like I said, we've been mostly bracketing that stuff out as well. Um, but I just mainly want you to keep in mind that he is a critic of this. Later, after his Nazi period, he is a critic of this. But he also might have been attempting to be a critic of it in being in time, but then he realized, oh, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen, now I understand, I'm enlightened, but also we need to win a war, which is why we have to double down on nihilism. We need to be more extreme in our nihilism than anyone else because otherwise we're not going to win this war. So he just makes a decision. And at the time, decisionism was very strong. Uh, it was like this whole ideology of if you haven't made a decision and committed yourself to that decision, then you're nothing, right? Uh, but before we turn back to the slides, I just want to point out that these two quotes are supposedly not real. Um, there's a lot of quotes like that. There's a lot of these two quotes by Bacon about putting nature on the rack and all of this. There are so many articles written critiquing modern science, and they kind of use this as their point of departure. And I've seen professors lecturing on it where they pull this in for an ecological or feminist critique. But f I can't track down the source of this quote. And I found a, a website that was saying, we can't track it down. And other people being like, yeah, I can't track it down either. I read everything I could get my hands on to try to find this. So uh, let me know if you find anything, everybody. Definitely share it in the forum if you find the real quote. But for the time being, I think that whether that's real or not doesn't really matter in a funny way. That's the funny thing about myth. A myth doesn't have to be true in this sort of limited sense to get at some kind of a deeper truth. What we have here is, well, either Bacon actually said it, or this is basically how they felt. Because you can definitely read it between the lines of everything they write. So either he didn't, either he came out and said it or someone put those words in his mouth because they were like, well, he really does mean this. Um, and that's illustrative for one reason. On the, on the one side here we have, this is kind of what Heidegger's worried about. And on the other side, this is how they become this sort of, like, this myth that is bigger than themselves, right? Where we blame Descartes for all of this stuff, when in reality, is it really true that a philosopher has to write it down and then 150 years of cultural trickle-down digestion of academics teaching this stuff and word getting around and autodidacts reading and talking about it for the ideas to become internalized in everybody so that they all become second nature? Is that really how it works? Or is it that everybody in those times was feeling this way and... Descartes was tuned into the moment of his times, and he was able to give it a more rigorous defense than anyone else was. Right? So when you, whenever people teach philosophy 101, it does seem like they're acting like, oh, Descartes writes it, everybody else learns it over time. Now when we read Descartes, so many of the things that he said feel like, oh, someone would say that today. But maybe... Maybe it's always the fact that there's a part of everyone, Native Americans, Chinese people, Africa, anyone, has a little bit of Descartes in them, but it's just part of the human soul. We just think rationally. We're all rational in, in some sense. He just fucking nailed it, right? He nailed it with his method. Um, so I don't know. Can we assign responsibility to him or not? So I want to put all that into question and then read the quote from page 128. 
Descartes' conception of the world is ontologically defective, but he's not just wrong. We have to show that his interpretation and the foundations on which it is based have led him to pass over both the phenomenon of the world and the being of those entities within the world, which are proximally ready to hand. So his context, he's writing in, uh, in the 16, between like 1620 and 1650 is when he's doing all of his writing which is roughly 100 years after the Protestant Reformation, which was itself about 60 years after the invention of the printing press. So the printing press creates the industry for books. And then Descartes was writing his meditations. He spent his whole life kind of preparing to write his meditations. He finally writes them, and he feels like he's made some genuine discoveries, and he's solved the problem between this division, this division between uh, church and state or church and science. He thinks he's solved it. Actually, yeah, so I guess a state would be on the church side. Science is on the other side, right? Um, and he's... He's, he thinks he's found like the Philosopher's Stone with his meditations, and he really wants to get them out there. But then he spends a few years not publishing them, really hesitating, not sure what to do. And the reason is because Galileo, Galilee, had been taken in and forced to recant by the Inquisition. Descartes was like, well... It's funny, the part where he says this in the, in the Discourse on Method, he says, you know, I've been thinking about publishing this, but then somebody that I know who believes something about physics uh, got in a lot of trouble for that belief, and I'm not saying I believed what he believed, but I'm just saying I didn't see that it went against the church, and so I thought it wouldn't be wrong if I did believe it, but now that I know it is wrong to believe it, I'm kind of worried. Because what other, what other things might I believe that could get me in a lot of trouble? Right? Cancel culture before cancel culture, right? And he's just like, I don't know what I can talk about anymore. Because, yeah, I see that this person's getting canceled for saying something. I, I would never say such a thing. But I believe other things that I think are okay. And maybe they're not okay. I don't know. I don't want to get hang drawn and quartered. I don't want to get put in the stockade. I don't want to be tarred and feathered. I don't want to be put on the rack and tortured. And so that's the situation he's writing in under extreme persecution. And so he takes the discourse on method and writes it in French. It's an appeal to the people, right? He's not making an appeal to the established academics. He's, he's going straight underground. He's saying, I'm just going to speak the vulgar tongue and tell everybody what I achieved in my meditations and tell them all, I'm sorry, I will not be able to publish that shit while I'm alive because I'm scared. So what he's hoping to do with, the med with his uh, discourse on method is show people, look, I'm nice. I'm not out to kill God. Come on. It's all good. You should let scientists do their thing, and scientists can have a, a, a sort of symbiotic relation with the church, and we'll all stay in our lanes. And he, he thinks that he establishes that by creating a strict, strict division between things of mind and spirit, and on the other hand, things of nature. And basically, if scientists can study the things of nature, Leave it to the theologians and priests to speak on behalf of the things of spirit and mind, and then we can have our lanes. But it is the strict maintenance of these lanes and the thought experiments and the deductions and everything that he develops in his meditations and his principles that gets us to the point where there's this really, 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 really strong dualism that is supposedly responsible for us all thinking, oh, there's mind and body or there's mind, body, and spirit, or there's spirit versus nature, right? So I have that, that's the man's context. But the myth's efficacy, like why the myth is so um, powerful, 
is because he really does lay out a beautiful vision for freedom from the oppression of nature, which can be very pr- oppressive, and we all forget about that. We forget that we used to see nature as a kind of enemy because nature used to actually fuck with us all the time. It still does to some degree. Um, it's also very intuitive. It's very relatable. And it's totally open to interpretation from a lot of different standpoints so that atheists and religious people can both get a lot of mileage from Descartes, right? So in a sort of sense, it does feel like um, every philosopher after Descartes starts with Descartes. Then they might go back to the classics and medievals, or they might just stay after Descartes through Kant. That's their period. Maybe they're after Kant or whatever. But the whole, the whole thing... It's usually through the meditations is where people start. And the meditations basically says, "Uh, here's how to do philosophy for real. We start with radical doubt where we clear away all preconceptions that are doubtable whatsoever. And then we try to get down to the most essential thing and build up from there part by part just like you do in math. That's going to run fundamentally contrary to the hermeneutical approach that says we are always already in the world. We have a lot of presuppositions that are just our existentials. They're the structures of our being in the world. Um, To eradicate those uh, from the analysis is actually to cut ourselves out of the picture. And so then when you come to the product of your thinking being nihilism, you shouldn't be surprised because you actually excluded us and our kind of meaning prima facie and you devalued it in doing so. Right, The focus on presence and repeatability makes us feel that any, anyone or anything that's finite, that's here for a while and then goes away and it's gone afterwards, that's less valuable, that's less meaningful, it's less repeatable, it's not real truth, it's not the real good. This is why math and those aspects of the entities in the world that are unchanging gets taken to be this, oh, this amazing, like, holy grail of all knowledge. Of course, it it gives us a kind of knowledge, which is an essential grasp that renders things useful to us, right? Helps us break them down into their parts, right? Like Minecraft. Descartes is Minecraft world. So the menace, though, the menace of presence ontology I have that it's a menace against the church. Obviously, it's a menace against the church because if he said, if he argues, we can have this strict division so long as we remember that God's existence is the only guarantee, guarantor of anything we perceive, much less knowledge. He creates that division. He argues we need God to back up all of the other substances. But the thing is, is any anyone else who's kind of coming later who goes, hmm. Well, I don't know that I need God to do that. And I can just take the things of nature as the things that they are, and I don't need to listen to these priests. Um, obviously, that's a problem for the church. Descartes makes it really easy to do that. He is supposedly devout, but there's also people who think, no, he was, he was, uh, it was always a conniving sort of project, always looking to undermine the church. I'm, I don't care, right? But that's why he is considered a menace against the church, I'm saying that he's a menace against science because I do believe that it is people usually reading his meditations in a philosophy class in their undergrad um, that kind of confirms a lot of things, a lot of biases, kind of solidifies a whole approach to thinking and doing philosophy that is scientistic. And scientism is bad for science, right? Scientism is treating... Um, All knowledge, all truth, all goodness as um, reducible to that which can be derived, ascertained, and uh, verified scientifically, um, or else it's just not true. It's just not good. It's just incorrect. It's not real knowledge, right? That's scientism. Um, Scientism obviously develops rigorous ways of talking about specific objects, right? Like uh, geometry's specific object is spatial entities, right? Uh, well, it's really good at talking about those things. It's not really good about talking about other things. Have you ever tried to use algebra to make food? 
I mean, maybe you could, or sorry, maybe you could actually with algebra, but like, have you ever tried to use geometry? I don't know, to some degree, maybe ratios, but the basic point is, is like, it's, it's, you can only use uh, concepts, formulas, and rules from one science or math in a sort of analogous way when you're dealing with some other kind of object that it wasn't developed for. And then you're usually forcing the issue. You're usually forcing your ideas onto something. And uh, the, the goal of philosophy from Aristotle through Descartes is not to be forcing, right? Uh, obviously, the idea of dialectics is also to not be forcing. You start with the phenomenon, you start with the, the notion, and you unfold it, but you're not trying to force ideas from outside onto it. That's at least the ideal, and obviously scientism runs against that ideal. So the presence of, so the menace of presence ontology also is a menace of modern nihilism and capitalist rationalization. I already touched on those enough, I feel like, for now, and we can come back to it in the Q&A if you want me to expand on it. Uh, presence ontology, I've already said it a few different ways. I'm, I'm happy for the time being, and we can always come back to it. Look at this funny image of Descartes. It looks like he's in the, uh, the Upside Down from Stranger Things. <laughs> so uh, will somebody volunteer to read? Who... So maybe raise your hand and then um, we'll go to page 127. Ken has it. The quote is the second paragraph. This paragraph is the summary of sections 19 and 20, which is basically, no, it's not the completion of, of those sections. Well, actually, no, it is. Wait, hold on. It's from the Dust the Ontological. Yes, sir. So basically, let me say one thing. This is the summary of sections 19 and 20. Section 21 is a hermeneutical discussion of 19 and 20, the foundations of that worldview, which is Cartesianism. But this quote that you're about to read is the summary of sections 19 and 20. So it's a really wonderful quote. You should have lots of lines beside it because if you get confused in sections 19 and 20, this is really where he quilts everything. Go for it, Ken. <clears throat> Thus, the ontological grounds for defining the world as res extensa have been made plain. They lie in the idea of substantiality, which not only remains unclarified in the meaning of its being, but gets passed off as something incapable of clarification and gets represented indirectly by a way of whatever substantial property belongs to the most preeminently to the particular substance. Moreover, in the way of defining substance through some substantial entity lies the reason why the term substance is used in two ways. What is here intended as is substantiality and it gets understood in terms of characteristics of substance a characteristic which itself an entity. Because something ontical is made to underline the ontological, the expression substantia functions sometimes with a signification which is ontological, sometimes with one, with, with one which is ontical, but mostly with one which is hastily ontico ontological Behind this slight difference of signification, however, there lies a hidden failure to master the basic problem of being. To treat this adequately, we must track down the equi equivocation in the right way. He who attempts this sort of thing does not just busy himself with mere verbal significations, he must venture forward into the most primordial problematic of the things themselves to get such nuances straightened out. Because Cartesianism is so commonsensical to us, because we tend to project it over everything and interpret everything in that way, he says, we've really got to get back to the things themselves. And that's the motto of phenomenology, is to stop copying and pasting criteria uh, or methods or concepts or rules from other fields of the sciences onto the human, the humanities, our social being. And more importantly, to remember that all of these things are 
regions of world disclosure. We open up regions of world disclosure with our practical ways of being in the world. I'm on a farm right now. That is a region of world disclosure. Like here, the southeast wind actually means something. Remember when he says that the southeast wind can be taken as a sign, as a, like rain is coming or something? Um, I don't actually know if it is the southeast wind because I'm not a real farmer here. I did grow up here, but I never really had to think about it in the way my parents have to. But, you know, my parents don't even look at that. They just look at the weather forecast. And so my mom, the first day that we get here, my mom was covering, like putting netting or like some kind of like a wrap over rows. And my dad was like, what are you doing that for? We, you know, we're done. And she's like, no, it's going to frost tonight. And then dad was like, no, it's not. And mom was like, yeah, it is. The weather forecast says that it's going to be uh, like this temperature. And my dad was like, well, my weather forecast says that it's going to be this temperature. And then they had their little argument about which weather, which, which one was right. And mom was like, well, better safe than sorry. And so... The weather forecast, like for most people, is taken as a sign for whether you should like bring a hoodie with you when you go out. Like maybe you need to have a rain jacket with you when you go out, an umbrella. Um, is it going to be hot today? Can I wear shorts? It's aesthetic almost, right? It's it's basically like, oh yeah. And then when the rain comes, it's just like this inconvenience. Oh, it's an inconvenience. And maybe you like the smell of it. Maybe you like to dance in it. But the chances are most of us take it as some kind of an inconvenience or just like whatever. We, maybe we project onto it whatever mood we're feeling, you know. The point is, is that there is a primordial involvement with rain that we actually have, right? It actually speaks to something. And if you are involved in bringing things into existence that sustain us, that we all require, that is farming, or some kind of tending to the, the fruit of the trees or what have you, you know, the fruit trees. However you're dealing, however you're getting your food from nature, if you're getting your food from nature, even if you're using a weather forecast and it's not just the southeast wind, rain has a positive signification. It's bringing life right? Like if you don't have rain, your food doesn't grow as well, right? We go into the grocery store and we look at the shelf and go, eh, doesn't look ripe enough. We go, eh, there's, eh, whatever. Uh, and it's just like, it's just up to our fancy. It just becomes a consumer choice. Whereas when you're out here, I don't know, there's something more real about it, right? And so, at the, so I, I say all of this because this is, this is kind of what he's getting at. When he, he wants to get at this primordial problematic of the things themselves and to get the nuances straightened out. The problem with substance is that it's a very confused term for Descartes. He's using it in an ontico-ontological way. He's taking the ontic to be ontological. Um, that's really confusing to me. I always trip up and get confused about it. But the basic point is that he's taking the way things are as their conditions of possibility, right? And it's, he's limiting the possible to the actual. We'll just kind of leave it at that for now and then dig into this definition of substance a little bit on pages 125 and 126. So if you have the book in front of you, that's fantastic. I don't share giant quotes on my slides anymore because I really, really, really do assume an audience of people who have the book. I really don't think you should be fucking around reading Being in Time if you don't have a physical copy of it. I'm, I don't know if I said that as clearly on syllabus day because I was kind of more relativistic about it. But it's just like you want to be able to get away from devices and just read it for a few pages. And it's, it's going to pay off. Page 125, uh, first, it just begins as section 20. Substantiality is the idea of being to which the ontological characterization of the res extensa harks back. So presence ontology that's, that thinks that things being extended in space, 
the uh, it, you know take away their secondary qualities of color and and hardness or of motion or you just go with like the things that don't change about these entities under any situations and then that's the essence of it and this is this idea of presence ontology harkens back to this idea of the res extensa and substantiality. So what is substantiality? Some Latin. Is anybody fluent in Latin and knows how to pronounce it in a way that makes it sound cool? I'd let you read it, but I'm just going to go ahead and assume that you don't. And I'll read his basic paraphrase. By substance, we can understand nothing else than an entity which is in such a way that it needs no other entity in order to be. This idea of like self-standing, self-sufficient, totally isolatable, atomized, discrete entities being the only real kinds of entities that there are. Cutting out the fundamental relationality of all of the things that are ecologically entwined, right? Cutting out the way that we are in the world, immersed in it meaningfully. Cutting all of that out up front. It's not just for substances of physical things, like this mug, this computer, that camera. But it's also for us, our bodies which he separates radically from our minds, which he thinks live forever. The ego, the mind, the soul, all the same thing for him. And he thinks he's able to make that radical division because he actually has such a profound trust or faith in the idea that that which is most real about something is that which is unchanging and not dependent on anything else, which is on the one hand, sort of a definition for the kind of being that God has. And now that kind of definition of being is being put onto all of the entities that we take to be most real. But then it's also taken onto ourselves, which is why he's like, look, I can imagine the world, I can imagine like the world ceasing to be. But I can't imagine not thinking, right? And if I were to be not thinking, I wouldn't be existing. Right, so he's, and then he goes, well, that means that my mind is independent from my body. It must be, because I can, it's self-standing. It's, I don't know, it's with this weird sort of thing that he does to get there. And of course, there's this big hermeneutical question of like, does he really mean any of the theological things that he says? Or is this what he has to say so that he doesn't get hung, drawn, and quartered? Because he is writing under persecution. And so the Leo Strauss reading of this would mean that we have to take his leaps in logic. Because he's so deliberate and so careful. Anywhere where he makes an obvious leap that's going to confirm the biases of people who would kill him... We have to think, well, the esoteric way to read that is he's hoping the, the smartest readers are going to, you know, oh, yeah, he's not an idiot. If he makes this huge leap at this one spot just to satisfy these people, then that's like Socrates saying, oh, yes, well, to the gods then, like, give them what is theirs. You know, absolutely, we must sacrifice. He's just saying the things that one says, right? Maybe. But that kind of hermeneutical question is one that we use while reading the entirety of the Discourse on Method, never assuming that it is that way, but just keeping it on the table because structural stultification, which is to say never having our time energy, uh, results to never really reading. And insofar as we learn to read, we tend to read in a way that is functionally illiterate. And the functionally illiterate way of reading is you read and you just take the transparent meaning to be the fundamental meaning of the thing that you're reading. And you never bring in hermeneutical methods so that you can take the text and kind of get some distance from it because you're like, oh, well, there's these different readings of it, right? So I'll be sharing that link with you all later today uh, to the exegetical reading we did of the Discourse on Method. I finally got it uploaded. But yeah, this idea of something being self-standing and independent, that's the idea of substance. And it's also the idea, his idea of God. It's also his idea of the ego. 
And it's part of why he can say, well, we've got nature over here. It's a bunch of self-standing entities. And we've got God over here. And we've got the mind over here. That's, and he uses triangles as an example, right, from geometry. There's no such thing as a perfect triangle. But, of course, we can derive them beyond any uh, shadow of a doubt. We can have clear and distinct conceptions of triangles. Uh, and we'll never find one in nature. We'll never find it. We'll never find the perfect circle in nature. You find a, a band called the perfect circle, but that's in culture. You'll never actually find this anywhere but it, as a mental object. But it's so clear. It's so distinct. It must be more real than anything we actually observe through our senses because the kind of certainty we get from mathematics is his criterion for all things if they are to be true or judged bullshit. One of the things I've been thinking a lot about is I really wish that I had a blackboard and I could actually or uh, like use chalk or like a whiteboard because and then I just had my notes and because then I, th I think there's something about that. The slides, if, you, if you're too caught up on like trying to read everything on the slide, um, it can be distracting. And so I hope that it's not. But uh, I guess the last thing that was on the slide is world on a platter. He really just wants the world to be served up on a platter by science. He thinks, he thinks that that's ultimately the goal here. And maybe he's not wrong, all right? We don't know. Maybe he's not wrong. Heidegger thinks he's wrong, though. So we're going to read the last paragraph of 128. Uh, Christopher, you want to read the last paragraph of 128? And while you get sure. there, while you get there, I'm going to say a couple of things. Math is the guarantor of knowledge. This really is a very popular idea, and so problematizing it, thinking about it critically, um, it's it's difficult and it's very counterintuitive because we tend to do that. That's why people call the hard sciences the hard sciences, STEM the hard sciences. Of course, engineering is not a hard science. Oh, it is. Oh, it is. Because it delivers the world as consumable on a platter for us. And we just care about efficacy, right? All right, take it away. Okay. Uh, in our exposition of the problem of worldhood, section 14, we suggested the importance of obtaining proper access to this phenomenon. So in criticizing the Cartesian point of departure, we must ask which kind of being that belongs to Dasein we should fix upon as giving us an appro appropriate way of access to those entities with whose being as extensio Descartes equates the being of the world. The only genuine access to them lies in knowing, intellectio, in the sense of the kind of knowledge we get in mathematics and physics. Mathematical knowledge is regarded by Descartes as the one manner of apprehending entities which can always give assurance that their being has been securely grasped. If anything measures up its own kind of being to the being that is accessible in mathematical knowledge, then it is in the authentic sense. Such entities are those which always are what they are. Accordingly, that which can be shown to have the character of something that constantly remains makes up the real being of those entities of the world which get experienced. That which enduringly remains really is. This is the sort of thing which mathematics knows. That which is accessible is an entity through mathematics makes up its being. That's perfect. That's, the, that, that's okay. good. That's good. Thank you. Hi, 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 yeah. So this is really cool. If you who watched the uh, the conversations that I did with Nick, who's currently not present. Yeah, Nance, you remember. So these were, these were based on the history of the concept of time, which I keep saying is the real introduction to this book. We should all treat it as such. And in the beginning, I think it's probably in the preface as well as in the introduction, um, there's a couple quotes there that I tried to dig up by doing a quick word search and I couldn't actually find it using the word non-temporal and using the word um, 
yeah, using the word non-temporal with a hyphen and without a hyphen, I wasn't able to find what I was looking for. But he says explicitly there that the reason he's going to take the time as the horizon for getting back to the question of being is because we've been caught up in this split between the natural and historical sciences. But the natural and historical sciences, which he wants to get out before, he wants to go back to before the split and think what happened there, um, because really like both thinking about nature and thinking about nature scientifically, as well as human sciences, so hard and soft sciences on both sides, both of those are rooted in the human condition, both of those are rooted in our ontological possibilities, both of those are um, indicative of us in some way, but also these are modes of interpretation, only possible modes of, in, of world disclosure. There are other modes of world disclosure. And for him, philosophy is supposed to be bigger and before any of these regions. And so how do we do a proper philosophy of science? We have to get out before this, this division, right? Well, he thinks that, her, that time should be the horizon upon which we ask the question of what is being in the first place, as well as what is the meaning of the question of being as well as what is the being of the being who asks the question of the meaning of being, right? Like this, all of these questions, he wants to put those on the horizon of time. Why? Because both the natural sciences and the historical sciences take time in different ways, in fundamentally different ways, but the essences of the objects under analysis are considered as something that can be derived through some specific understanding or interpretation, we should say, some specific interpretation of time. Right. Interpretation is always some ontical thing that gets put on top of understanding for Heidegger. Interpretation is always secondary. Any interpretation could be otherwise. There's always other interpretations. But there is a fundamental understanding that is prior to the ontical interpretations. So how are entities understood through time between this, uh, between, on the one side, nature, natural sciences, and on the other side, historical sciences? And the answer is, Mathematical objects are considered non-temporal. Theological objects are considered supratemporal. And all the other objects are considered either historical in the sense of evolution or historical in the sense of genealogy. This is the divisions that he's seeing. Oh, these are fundamental time divisions. But he says that non-temporal entities these are what math deals with at its finest, non-temporal. That's a problem if we are fundamentally temporal beings. That is a problem if we are the beings for whom temporality is an issue for us. That is a, that is a problem if we are the beings who are being unto death in the sense that we have to prepare for death. We have to think about the fact that not just we will perish, but more importantly at the existential level, anything we under Anything we undertake can fall apart. That's existential death. Anything we undertake can fall apart. Our ultimate purpose on this earth could fall apart. Everything I've committed my life to could fall apart. Uh, someone could give me a lobotomy. I would lose everything I've put into trying to do philosophy and th underground theory, right? Um, in the same way, an athlete could break a leg, and then never, never actually get back to where they were, right? So whatever it is that's really, made, whatever quilts everything else in your existence and gives it that structure because you have this for the sake of which that everything else is in, in order to and that everything else is a for which that structures your world with significance, that shit can break down. And then you're sitting there and you feel worthless because you're not in it, right? Well, we're those kinds of beings for whom temporality is an issue for us. And this presence ontology way of world disclosure literally assumes that's all meaningless and that what's meaningful is that which is permanent. What's meaningful is that which cannot fall apart. 
which meaningful is that which is independent. But in reality, everything's dependent. In, in our reality, everything's dependent or it's meaningless. Which another way of saying that is, it's either close or it's far. It's either closeness or remoteness. So I'm gonna skip to the part on Dasein's world. We might come back to that later, but I've basically beat this dead horse uh, called Descartes. The quote is, all wares are discovered and circumspectively interpreted as we go our ways in everyday dealings. They are not ascertained and cataloged by the observational measurement of space. This is the beginning of section C, Dasein's world. And I love this breakdown of four kinds of nearness that I'm stealing from Hubert Dreyfus. I was able to give page numbers for the first two and not the second two, but they're there. Oh, the third, the fourth one's there as well. I'm just missing the one for number three. But basically, there's four kinds of ways that things can be near to us that Heidegger uses to talk about this. Dreyfus gets all tangled up in knots over it because he's like, well, these are different ways of things being near. And he, and basically what he wanted Heidegger to do is to be a bit more systematic. But the fact is, is I think Heidegger's just using these as four different ways that things can be near to us, show, so as to show that we are fundamentally beings for whom spatiality is meaningful and, and not something based on measurements, right? So the first one is accessibility, availability. Let's look at page 135 for that. It's the, kind of the middle. I'm just going to read a couple parts. To what extent has our characterization of the ready to hand already come up against its spatiality? We have been talking about what is proximally ready to hand, meaning closest. This means not only those entities which we encounter first before any others, but also those which are close by. What is ready to hand in our everyday dealings has the character of closeness. To be exact, this closeness of equipment has already been intimated in the term readiness to hand, right? Because obviously it wouldn't be ready to hand if it wasn't close, which expresses the being of equipment. The satellite that we are using to communicate right now is ready to hand. None of you were thinking about it until I said that probably. You probably weren't thinking about that, right? But it's there. It is ready to hand. We could even try to ascertain its actual location outside of our planet. We really could, like we could observe it through a telescope. We could make it present at hand. I mean, if it broke down, somebody would have to go make it present at hand if they meant to fix it, right? Um, so any kind of troubleshooting of like buffering and lag and, and internet speeds kind of comes down to a present hand thing. Is it a problem with my computer? Is it a problem with the, the, the subscription plan that we're on? Is it a problem with the satellite? That satellite is close as fuck. That satellite is as close to us as our eyeglasses are when we don't even know that our eyeglasses are on our nose, which is one of the wonderful examples that he uses. And it looks like the only person who can relate to that is gonna be Christopher. <laughs> But I mean, people, yeah, you forget that you're wearing sunglasses even if you don't wear glasses normally. You'll forget that you're wearing them. So accessibility and availability is one kind of nearness. Mattering is one kind of nearness. Oh, I forgot that I have Celine Dion on here. And, I, and, and so I kind, of, I kind of should have said it already. I already said near and far, so. I thought it was because of the Titanic with the billionaires. <laughs> no, no. Did the music come through? Were you able to hear it just now when I played it? Kind of. Zoom really makes it hard to play stuff over it because the AI cuts out music because it doesn't want copyright problems. It'll be on the recorded version, so you'll hear it loud and clear on the recorded version. But um, mattering nearness is what Celine Dion is actually singing about. Right? So... You could be in Australia and nothing in Australia matters to you because everything in the world 
the only things that matter to you right now is that your family's going through a crisis and everyone's there but you. Right? Existentially, that's the closest thing to you. And you're go it's going to change your behavior. Your behaviorism is nothing if it can't take this into account. Right? We are thought of as beings who are empirically ascertainable. Uh, we can be made to drool at the dinging of a bell just like a dog. But I don't know. When the dog is like completely uninterested in playing and it doesn't want to do any of the normal things that it wants to do and it's sitting there completely lost in thought. Is it lost in thought? I don't know. I'm projecting. But the reason I project that onto the dog in this situation is because we could sit there and just be completely spacing out, not able to keep up with work, not able to keep up with friends, not able to keep up with anything because our heart is somewhere else. And that changes our behavior because we're going to do something different now. We have to change our life if that's how we feel. We'll have to, in this example I use, leave Australia and go somewhere to actually see your family. Or you'll say, I can't go to work today and you're going to try to have a phone call with the family or something like that. There's a lot of different ways that this can factor in, but it's not just existential. It's not just subjective. It's not just arbitrary. It's not just made up. It's real and it's not just real for us because it changes reality. We change reality because something matters in the sense of nearness and we bring it near to us empirically because it mattered to us existentially first we'll change the whole, we'll move mountains we'll change the actual way that nature works we'll biologically engineer things just to make what we think matters last longer right that's something about us that's not something about science. That's something about us, the kinds of beings who use science to try to extend our lives, who try to travel faster to get to loved ones, right? So that's not arbitrary, and I don't think this is idealism to say it. Attention nearness. Obviously, uh, you, you all are right now closest to me in terms of my attention. And... Insofar as you're succeeding in paying attention to the lecture, Christopher, you're not thinking about your glasses unless I keep pointing them out, right? So that's attention nearness. Then there's the maximal hold for manipulation nearness. And really, this is just like pure readiness to hand, right? It's near, like that's the satellite. The satellite is near to us in that sense because it is immediately implicated in all of our involvements. What's that, Nance? Or like the pin I'm using right now, is this that type of near? So where you use it, you're taking notes? Yeah. Then yes, absolutely. Like it's not just a physical thing. It is like I'm utilizing it. That's what makes it this. Yeah, like for instance, uh, this book, I've not thought about it once this entire time. This is uh, Responsibility and Judgment by Hannah Arendt. And uh, it's just behind me. It's been physically close to me in a Cartesian sense, present at hand, if anyone was looking at this world situation right now, they would be like, ah, that's, that's what's closest to Dave. No, the satellite's a lot closer to me. If this book disintegrated, I wouldn't have even noticed. Okay, if it got raptured, I wouldn't even know it. But if that satellite got disintegrated, we're all gonna be knowing about it. We're all gonna be trying to figure out what happened there, right? It's closer. This is all very relatable. And so for, for Dreyfus, this becomes a problem because he thinks that, oh, these are all different things. And the point is, is like, no, these are all things that we can verify as some kind of closeness that all get us at this deeper ontological sense of closeness, okay? which is obviously prior to thinking about things present at hand. Think about it. Why do you even start measuring things in the first place except for the fact that you're trying to make room for something or you're trying to get something out of the way so you can do something? So you can look at all four of these, accessibility, availability. Obviously, measurement comes in as a factor there. Um, if something's not accessible or we want it, we, yeah, we want it to be available. Um, something mattering being near to us, like we're trying to find our family, but we've been cut off from them. Um, you're you're going to start thinking about distances and where you have to go and how long it will take to get there to do this search, right? 
uh, attention nearness. Um, if the glasses break and you can't actually pay attention to what you're doing, it's now obstructing what you're trying to do. This is causing a breakdown in your equipment that's ready to hand, right? Um, or something could be distracting what, what, you're, what you're trying to pay attention to. These kind of breakdowns force us into presence at hand, and then we're going to try to problem solve. Maximal hold for manipulation. We talked about that the entire last lecture. So. so measurement versus meaningful distance, right? Like if I did a if I if I did do like an American standard translation and or, or American vulgar English, that's what I should an American vulgar English translation of being in time. Measurement versus meaningful distance would be one of the distinctions I'm using that's not being I mean it's Heidegger doesn't ever say meaningful, right? And part of the issue, and we did talk about this in the first week, is that the the word being is being translated different. What we see as uppercase B being is sometimes the meaning of being, and other times the word being itself, right? Which I wasn't going to bring this up at this moment, but right here, this first quote I think that we led off with on the Descartes, the man, the myth, and menace section, um, we have to show that this interpretation and the foundation, uh, his interpretation and the foundations on which it is based have led him to pass over both the phenomenon of the world and the being of those entities within the world, which are approximately ready to hand. If you take being to mean that which is most fundamentally real and you're already pretty Cartesian and you're thinking about things that way, then this would be idealism. But if you take being here to be the meaning of those entities, it's not. Right, which then this book would probably better translate into meaning in time. So measurement versus meaningful distance. Closeness slash remoteness is not measurable in a strict sense. I love the example he uses of smoking, which is why I got Midjourney to give me a really old looking Descartes smoking on a walk. Um, Let's find page 140. Oh, I'm already on it. Yeah, half an hour is not 30 minutes. It's right in the middle of page 140. Half an hour is not 30 minutes, but a duration, which has no length at all in the sense of a quantitative stretch. Right? Uh, objective distances versus hard and easy, right? Objective distances have nothing to do with, vers with, with hard versus easy. Obviously, oh, I'll use this one example. Um, coming back from Disneyland uh, earlier this year, Anne's brother decided to take a direct route back to Reno that added, I think, like two hours to the trip. And by the time we were in it, it was too late. We were way in it. And it was just like, well, let's enjoy the scenery. I didn't know that he was doing that. But uh, yeah, he basically looked at Google Maps. Google Maps said, this is how you should go. And he was like, oh, that requires going this way and that way. And it's all a roundabout. So now I'm just going to go straight. Of course, that just meant that a lot of the roads were 25 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour. You know, these stretches of sort of farmland, residential farmland, you know. And so... Yeah, Anne, were you going to say something? Oh, just, yeah, like his map had us going like back and forth, and then he'd go, wait, no, that's not right, and then turn around, and uh, yeah, so it got weird. It real, got real confusing. Objective distances, as we say in, the, in, in, in America, as the crow flies, um, has nothing to do with whether it's hard or easy, right? Um, if you you take the the paths that have been well established, Descartes had a great quote in the Discourse on Method. You take the well established route, even if it's zigzaggy, because it's it's more efficient than mountain climbing, rock climbing, going directly up and then directly down. That can be a lot more difficult because you're going to fall and break your break uh, break your everything, I guess. Um, but I have, sm I have smoking distance and media on page 140, and I'm trying to see where am I talking about that is media. It's above that. In the very top paragraph, it says, In Dasein there lies an essential tendency towards closeness. All the ways in which we speed things up, as we are more or less compelled to do today, push us on towards the conquest of remoteness. 
With the radio, for example, Dasein has so expanded its everyday environment that it has accomplished a deseverance of the world, a deseverance which, in its meaning for Dasein, cannot yet be visualized. Oh, he used the word meaning right there. That's why I really need to learn German and figure this out. But So this is McLuhan before McLuhan. This is McLuhan uh, 30 years before McLuhan, right? He's talking about how... So McLuhan will show us that the medium, what it mediates is perception. It's like... Uh, Electric technology, especially, is an extension of the central nervous system. Right now, we're all out in space, in a sense, because of that satellite that we're using, right? Or the satellites that we're using, right? This being extended and then also having, like, for instance, the cameras and Zoom mediate for our consciousness those things which are not present making them present. It's not just re-presenting. It's actually uh, making us more conscious of something that's remote than something that was close. Right? It's a conquest of remoteness. Being able to get anywhere and everywhere or communicate at the speed of light is what he's talking about right here. And it's what McLuhan spent his whole life thinking about. And so... McLuhan and Heidegger go really, really well together, especially in this chapter. Circumspective spatiality, page 137. Do we really want to read that? Do we have to? There's a big fucking quote there. You know what I'm going to have you do? Um, uh, Nance, you haven't read yet. I'm wondering if you can read the giant, the main paragraph from page 137 um, while I run to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Regions are not first formed by things which are present at hand together. They always are ready to hand already in individual places. Places themselves either get allotted to the ready to hand in the circumspection of concern or we come across them. Thus, anything constantly ready to hand of which circumspective being in the world takes account beforehand has its place. The where of its readiness to hand is put to account as a matter for concern and oriented toward the rest of what is ready to hand. Thus, the sun, whose light and warmth are in everyday use, has its own places, sunrise, midday, sunset, midnight. These are discovered in circumspection and treated distinctively in terms of changes in the usability of what the sun stows. Here we have something which is ready to hand with uniform constancy, although it keeps changing. Its places become accentuated indicators of the regions which lie in them. These celestial regions, which need not have any geographical meaning and yet, provide the weather beforehand for every special way of giving form to the regions which places can occupy. The house has its sunny side and its shady side. Way is divided up into rooms is oriented toward these, and so is the arrangement within them according to the character as equipment. Churches and graves, for instance, are laid out according to the rising and the setting of the sun, the regions of life and death, which are determinative for Dasein itself with, with regard to its own most possibilities of being in the world. Dasein, in its very being, has this being as an issue, and its concern discovers beforehand those regions in which some involvement is decisive. This discovery of regions beforehand is so determined by the totality of involvements for which the ready to hand, as something encountered, is freed. Yeah, any, any sort of comments on this? Sadly, the headphones didn't quite reach that far. Ah, yeah. So the discovery of regions beforehand is co-determined by the totality of involvements for which they are ready to hand as something encountered is freed. Remember, this isn't just talking about tools. We're also talking about language itself. 
And sure, we can make up words that talk about things that aren't really real. And we can even care a lot about those words. And our unconscious can really fixate on words that really don't have the meaning we think they do. But that's all only because we are the kinds of beings for which we have this kind of way of marking things out and being in the world circumspectively thanks to our sort of tool-like relation to language and its ability to make things, to make signs of things, right? The signs are able to hold in our head something that's not immediately present in our world. And then that can still be ready to hand in a sense because... Uh, like, for instance, you know, we could all plot how to overthrow a government or build a house or something like that just, just through writing letters or a Zoom call. Um, that planning ahead, strategizing, the logistics involved, all that would be impossible without a circumspective a shared circumspective awareness of the situation. So like, okay, let's say we want to build a house. Okay, we can have our president hand models of like the, the blueprints for the house and also like our understanding of like the way that the property is and all of that. But also like we probably all want to go and actually check it out for ourselves, check out the lay of the land, get, a, get figure it out before we start building, right? Um, the signs though, insofar as they're useful, speak to the real situation on the ground in a way that's meaningful to us. Any map, there could be a million different maps of the territory. Only certain maps are going to be useful for us for our purpose. And that's because there's a specific involvement, right? There's a specific undertaking that we are involved with. Um, I've got to wrap it up faster than I wish this week because I've got to start getting ready for the other thing. So I want to read this section from 141. Gosh, there's a great stuff about the telephone receiver and seeing and hearing as distant senses. I love that. Um, but the part I think I want to focus on here is at the top of 141. This is where you were about to read when you were reading, Christopher. A pathway which is, which is long objectively can be much shorter than one which is objectively shorter still, but which is perhaps hard going and comes before us as interminably long. Yet only in thus coming before us is the current world authentically ready to hand. The objective distances of things present at hand do not coincide with the remoteness and closeness of what is ready to hand within the world. Um, though we may know these distances exactly, this knowledge still remains blind. It does not have the function of discovering the environment circumspectively and bringing it close. This knowledge is used only in and for a concernful being which does not measure stretches, a being towards a world that matters to one. I have this as travel versus tourism, just as a fun little point, right? Like we come from a generation of people who are generally against being sort of suburbanite middle class tourists, right? People who just kind of come out of a plane, go to a couple of sites, take selfies, and uh, treat the whole place like it's a novelty, like it's just something that's on a store shelf there to satisfy our appetites, treating the whole thing like it's present at hand. We're here to gawk at it. And what Heidegger's saying is you actually have to be somewhere for a while to figure out how it works, right? That is the development of, or, or sorry, he would, he would call it the function of discovering the environment, <clears throat> the function of discovering the environment circumspectively. That's what you're doing. You're bringing it close. You could go to Aguas Calientes, Mexico for a few days but that's not enough time to bring it close. You got to live in it. You got to be get around. You got to know people. You got to know what kinds of events happen, what kinds of... The character of the place is not reducible to some unchanging essence. No, it's reducible to the actual situation, which is not reducible to any one thing, sadly. Sorry, Descartes. So yeah, disseverance and directionality. And so I have the movie poster for Severance here. Or sorry, the, the, the TV show. 
Severance is one of the best shows that's come out in the last few years. It's amazing. It's really, really good. You should watch it. It looks like at least three of you have seen it. Um, and it's basically about some people who undergo a sort of experiment, like there's a software corporation, um, and it makes it so that, like, yeah, they will do this thing to your brain so that when you're inside the building, you don't remember who you actually are on the outside. You have no recollection of what your outside life is like. And when you're on the outside, you have no recollection of what your inside life is like. And that's because, you know, the software company deals with, like, secrets. And it's just, you know, this is for the best. That is a good sort of way of thinking about this word severance, though. We are always severed from everything except for those things that are close, closest to us. So we are the kinds of beings who are always immersed in the world, always already immersed in language, already always already immersed in ready-to-hand circumspective dealings. Sure, but we are also the kinds of being for which we are always severed from all of those things that we're not involved with, not focused on, not thinking about. Now, of course, this is sort of the existential that he develops, the existential basis of remoteness and closeness. Remoteness and closeness are existential, ontical, like we can discover them with all the examples we already went over. One, two, accessibility, mattering, attention, readiness to hand. These are things we experience and that we can all verify. But what that tells us is that we are the kinds of beings for whom we are always in the processes of de-severing things which I think goes right hand in hand with the idea of freeing something into an involvement, right? Um, yeah, so our circumspective concern decides remoteness versus closeness. Dasein is always in place, occupying a here. Here is always understood vis-a-vis -a, -vis a yonder, which is just a really old way of saying over there. But the point is, is like, yeah, we're, we're always relational in the sense that we really are always in reference to everything else. And what the Cartesian way of doing things does is he just creates this big separation between, well, there's a bunch of bodies on a planet and it's in nature. And then there's like the mind stuff, it's eternal. And the stuff in nature, it's, we just read it through a mathematical grid. And we can read distances as measurements. It's very precise, it's very clear, it's very distinct. That's truth, right? And this has nothing to do with mattering, with meaning, with closeness, with any of these more existential terms. Uh, there's one short quote I do want to make sure to touch on since I spent so long really stressing the, his semiotics, his anti-postmodern semiotics that gets neglected in all of the secondary literature apparently. Uh, so at the top of 143, it's the first full paragraph. As disseverant being in, Dasein has likewise the character of directionality. Yeah, but this is not a, this is not like a compass kind of directionality. This is like we always have a sense, oh, things are to our left, things are to our right, things are above us, things are below us. Everything is placed in reference to our directionality. In this concern that is in the being in the world of Dasein itself, a supply of signs is presented. Signs as equipment taking, take over the giving of directions in a way which is explicit and easily manipulable. They keep explicitly open those regions which have been used circumspectively, the particular withers to which something belongs or goes or gets brought or fetched. If Dasein is, it already has as directing and desevering its own discovered region. Both directionality and disseverance as modes of being in the world are guided beforehand by the circumspection of concern. The circumspection of concern, meaning without the background conditions of circumspection, we can never focus on anything in our concern. Concern is sort of like saying focus. It's the concerns with which you are daily immersed, but the circumspective awareness 
it's a background condition of possibility for even making that the object of that concern intelligible. And then he also says that making room is an existential. I wish he'd expanded on that. But it's in that section where he's talking about bringing close. Um, or, or this is the section of bringing close. So I think it's on... Where is the making room? I thought it was right there. Oh, it's on page 146. Second, which is a full, the first full paragraph on page 146. Um, yeah, he says, Dasein can move things around or out of the way or make room for them only because making room understood as an existential belongs to its being in the world, right? It's because nothing arbitrarily sits in anything else, right? Instead, things are involved. So the question of is this idealism or subjectivism, I think that I've basically touched on this already. Um, but there, here's a good quote for really thinking about it. The homogenous space of nature shows itself when the entities we encounter are discovered in such a way that the worldly character of the ready to hand gets specifically deprived of its worldhood. The homogenous space of nature is this Cartesian way of thinking about things, where it's all just arbitrary. You, you just pick points and measure between those points, but there's no like fundamental points. There's no real, there's no signifiers that have any kind of a primordial basis in our involvements, because we've stripped ourselves out of the picture, and now we just think about it as a bunch of rocks and trees and animals. Um, but this deprives it of its worldhood and of its fundamental, meaningful relation to us. So is this idealism, meaning that matter is less important, it's all in our heads? Is this subjectivism, meaning that it's saying that that's which, that which is subjective is more meaningful or more real than that which is objective? Or, you know, there's a lot of ways of talking about this, and I don't really have the time to go into it. And I just kind of want to say it doesn't matter to for our purposes. We should kind of keep question marks over such things. Um, Richard, Capo, Richard Capo Bianco has spent his whole life, basically, his academic career arguing that it's not idealism, that Heidegger, his, he's a realist, um, uh, it's not just all in our heads. You can, all, you can obviously see how a lot of this could be used to argue that it is all just in our heads. Um, but that's exactly what Heidegger's trying to get out of, is this argument that that's all in our head. He's trying to say, no, yeah, we can get up in our heads and then it's all just bullshit. But that our ability to get up in our heads and just have a bunch of bullshit ideas is based in a fundamental, involved, worldly way of being that is itself something that we can't reduce to this stuff that's just in our heads, right? The part that's just in our heads, I would argue, is saying that because the sun is eventually going to swallow the earth, or there's going to be a heat death in the universe, entropy will make it so that eventually everything we've done on this earth will be forgotten and there will be no recollection of us ever. You know, um, that's, a, that's something in our heads. That's something that we do when we get up in our heads. And it's a way of getting up in our heads that cuts us off from the worldhood of the world and the way that we actually are in it most of the time. Because you get up in your head and you tell yourself, well, everything's meaningless. But guess what happens as soon as you're done with that? You go back to everything being meaningful again. So it's a weird present at hand ideological interpretation that is founded on our ability to be the kinds of beings who are in an understanding relation to the world in the first place right so it's a it's a it's like it's like the skeptic who's it's like your skepticism actually proves something doesn't it it proves that you're skeptical right um, in the same way our ability to sit here and go life's meaningless speaks to the fact that we're the kinds of beings for whom life is not meaningless. And if it was infinite, and if it was eternal, and if it was always repeatable, then Heidegger's going to argue it wouldn't be as meaningful, would it? 
obviously it's the facticity of death, of the fact that all of our projects can fall apart at any time, that makes us cherish the moments that we do have. Or at least it ought to, because if we take up a resolute stand toward our death, it can. It can tr supercharge things with meaning and help us stop living other people's fantasies and actually just live our own, our own life, right? That's the idea anyway. And so in the next chapter, we're going to get into the reason why none of this stuff we've been talking about with Dasein really is about an individual, but is actually always about a kind of life that is always immersed in the lives of others, that takes the models of the ways that others do things for the possibilities that one, that are, that are one's own most possibilities. Um, it's the section where we're going to get into the they. We're going to talk about dasman, which is the same thing as the they. Two ways of translating the same phenomenon. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I, I think it is something really to look forward to. And if I were you, I would try to give it a, a, real, um, a real go tomorrow. Or as soon as this is over, you know, go try to read a few pages. Because there are sections that are just like, oh, they're so good. And almost everything in One Dimensional Man can be derived from <laughs> the next chapter. So like I've told a lot of people who tell me, oh, you got to read One Dimensional Man. And I'm like, Marcuse just, he's over here like in a playpen playing with some toys that he borrowed from Heidegger and Marx and Freud. And we're not even sure about his usage of these toys. But that synthesis that he tries to do, it's just never as good as actually getting to the primary sources themselves. All three of those thinkers are better on their own. And then if we decide to synthesize them in some way, or you do it for yourself, cool. But uh, first, you got to give the devil his due. And if you want to think about authenticity and mass society, the public, this is the most formalized version of it. Whereas the first real stab at it was basically Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Kierkegaard. Um, and Kierkegaard's uh, little piece on the public is actually perfect for this. And I hope that I'll get to, get, hopefully I get a chance to, with some of you, go over that. Maybe as an exegetical reading or something. But basically Kierkegaard thinks about the public. Um, Nietzsche thinks about um, the herd and, and the slave morality um, and raisonnement and Schopenhauer thinks about how he fucking hates everybody and everything and uh, Heidegger goes well what are they all dealing with here and can we get to like the existential ontological condition of what they're all talking about and then from that can we derive a possible way forward or out of that that frees us from from this sort of unthinking bullshit that we internalize and go along with all the time. Um, and that's what we're going to be getting into. And I just, I really think it's great. But with that, everybody, thank you so much for coming to the lecture. Um, we have to close this thing out early. I sent you all out an email. There is going to be office hours tomorrow. So do, do look at that email. And if you have time, come to the office hours, bring questions about today's reading uh, or lecture. We'll talk about them then. And then after the office hours, Nance and... Anne are going to give people uh, a cool opportunity to do like a smaller breakout session, discussion groups, thinking about media usage and stuff like that. It's just something that you don't have to necessarily participate in. They'll be reflecting. Other people will be. You can just be present or you can actually engage. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, same event, same Zoom call going to be a special conversation with myself and Michael Downs of The Dangerous Maybe, and we will be going over Andre Gores's Paths to Paradise liber on Liberation from Work. And he's basically a, a, a an unorthodox kind of Marxist who uh, has been very um, uh, ignored. You won't find any videos on YouTube about him until uh, the one that we're going to put up. So if you want to be present for that and be able to engage in the Q&A or just catch it live before it ever goes public, uh, definitely come tomorrow. And with that, thank you everybody so much. Take care.
thinking is super uncool and that's why you should do it. It's just like almost anything that's like cool anymore. Um, yeah, it just sucks. And I think that's like what the underground movement has always been about is just like seeing what's in the mainstream being like, it ain't there and kind of like cobbling something together, you know? And, and yeah, it's a little mismatched, but that's like its beauty. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, where workers with earbuds can find genuine liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. We bring primary texts from leading lights of diverse fields to bear on topical issues and works popular in our current world. Theory Underground is a publishing house as well as lecture course and social media platform. You've been reading Underground Theory. Yes. And, uh, Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Jesus Christ. Seriously. This is a little experiment in what I, David McCarricker, can pull off without relying on the academy or the algorithmic dictates of the attention economy. Usually a good edited collection has good essays, but you only want to read a few. Every essay makes me want to read the other essays because you have a vision. Everyone that you invited, you invited for a reason. You weren't some fake publicist who's like, hey, someone says a new book, have them on your show. No, you only talk to people because you've read shit by them that you've right, thought right, about, that right. you think has value, even if you disagree. So I think that's what's amazing. I believe that I am, like so many others, pioneering a future in which educators can form learning webs that will make learning as a way of life enjoyable and emancipatory. However, before these tools become accessible, they have to be experimented with. That's why I built my own website and app using nothing more than my own saved wages, five patrons, and some small classes of students over the last year. Of course, I also have had my wife Anne's moral support and help with accounting so that I don't get in trouble with the IRS or whatever. In less than a year, Theory Underground has already put out eight courses, two books, one, my book, Time Energy, and the other, Underground Theory, which has over 30 contributors, including works written by students at Theory Underground, some of my fellow travelers, and colleagues in the broader universe of underground theory. Beyond the books and courses, though, you will also find interviews, reading, exegetical reaction sessions, and live weekly events for working class autodidacts, independent researchers, and renegade academics. These include a variety of clubs and cohorts that meet on a weekly or monthly basis. If you want to get involved, there are four main subscription levels. Think of it like a gym membership, but for your mind. The point is to make learning, practice, and theoretical comprehension a way of life. Support at this stage of the operation is more crucial than ever because my savings were used up over the last year of getting this established. If I can triple my subscribers in the next two months, I can quit my gig at Amazon and focus on this work full time. All I need is a few more people at each of the levels or a couple big time patrons who just want to see it happen. Right now I am doing a patron and site subscriber drive. So excuse the commercial. But if you end up really liking what goes on at this channel, consider signing up soon. If you cannot afford it, but want to get involved with some of the stuff behind the paywall, I have made a financial aid scholarship you can sign up for here in the description. Quick side note, some people ask about the profit motive. At this point, I have not actually made a return on any of my investment in terms of the amount of time energy that I put into things, the amount of savings I've actually put into things, the opportunity cost of the work that I'm doing as opposed to the other kinds of things that I could be doing for money. Uh, but more importantly, I don't actually make enough to pay for my cost of living. The goal is to make enough for my cost of living. And then once that is achieved, everything over that amount is going to go towards expanding the operation to the point where I can hire Michael Downs, AKA Mikey of the Dangerous Maybe, to be a full-time researcher and part-time teacher at Theory Underground. All right, so with that aside, I just wanna say also, if you are a worker with earbuds, what's up? 
I see you. I work at Amazon part-time and everything I do is for my past self who used to work there full-time. Most workers with earbuds couldn't care less about theory, but I do believe a working class intellectual revolution could grow out of the underground theory scene. My hope is that what I have built here will contribute to making the scene something more than just a scene and you into something more than just a scene kid. We're trying to make this into a real intellectual milieu capable of leading a way forward beyond the imminent crises facing humanity. But for that, we need thinking now more than ever. Start thinking. I hope that you either will or have enjoyed the program and also make sure to like, comment, subscribe and leave this playing in the background all the time while you're doing other things. Playing long form theory underground content in the background while you do things has, in the near future, been scientifically proven to emancipate minds from the functional illiteracy imposed on workers by the structural stultification of time energy. This is achieved by re-territorializing circumspective concern. Also, to some degree, it is for the algorithm. Take it out, I can dip my moves up before your mind! <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> I love you too.